Good evening, everyone. My name is Inko, and we are currently in the faction selection screen for Age of Charlemagne, which is a new DLC for Attila. It was released last Thursday, I believe, on the 10th. Uh, I gotta say, I'm pretty excited to play this because it seems to me as if it's almost like a medieval 2.5. It's got the fucking Pope in it, for God's sake. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm really excited about that. I mean, we're, we're working our way towards, like, a full-on Medieval 3 eventually, hopefully. Um, but in the meantime, this will uh, satis uh, satisfy that, that itch quite well. Um, I'm going to be playing as the Carolingian Dynasty, the Kingdom of Charlemagne, for two reasons. One, I'm boring as hell and I like to play the mainstream stuff. And two, though I may be boring, Charlemagne himself is anything but. He is an extremely interesting character. Uh, historically, and I feel like that will be reflected in the campaign with scripted missions and stuff like that, so it's going to be... I mean, the focus is most definitely on Charlemagne rather than, say, um, the Danes or Cordoba, although they are important players. Um, so what we will do very quickly is uh, we'll go over the rest of the factions, we'll look at our uh, information, and then we'll hop into the campaign, uh, do an overview. Now... There are eight factions in the campaign. Before we do that, though, I think I should say this is not really a full-blown expansion. Um, rather, it's more kind of just like an, an overhaul that adds new features. Um, for example, a lot of the art assets from base Attila is used. Like a lot of the, the Germanic art assets, the voices, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the maps themselves for settlements are pretty much unchanged. You can still find, like, statues of Odin and stuff, which is a little disappointing, but... Uh, that's, that's just fine. For the price point, that's just fine. I can understand they didn't want to go back and get the art team involved to, you know, re-record voices and all this shit. Rather, I think what they're doing here is just kind of testing out features. For example, War Weariness is a feature that, um, is a big component of, say, like, Europa Universalis. So it's nice to see that kind of get smashed in there. In addition, it looks like they've, they're, they're, they've overhauled the buildings. So there's now like 6 to 10 buildings, 10 to 15 buildings in each slot because they've streamlined it a little bit, I would say, for the better. Um, and they've also reduced the upkeep of units so you can now get a lot more. So there's a lot of stuff kind of at play and I'm not really explaining it well right now, unfortunately. But I think we'll, uh, we'll get to uh, take a look at that when we actually hop in the campaign. But before we do that, as I said, we'll look at the eight factions. Uh, so, aside from the Kingdom of Charlemagne, there are the Kingdom of Asturias in northern Spain, the Emirate of Cordoba in southern Spain, there are the Avars, which are in what looks to be like Hungary, here is Venice, uh, the Alps, I would say this is like Hungary, uh, Czechoslovakia perhaps, I can't quite say. Um, in addition, there are the Danes in Denmark. The Lombards in northern Italy, so here are the Lombards, here are the uh, Avars. Uh, the Kingdom of Mercia in England. And then, of course, the uh, Saxons, the Westphalian Saxons, on the border of the Frankish Kingdom. They're just south of Denmark. But as I said, we will play as Charlemagne. I, th I think, well, we'll talk about traits very briefly. Um, none of the traits for any of these factions really stand out. To me as like you know they don't really make me want to play that that faction charlemagne himself is kind of like that these two traits are i could do without them the avars have bonuses to cavalry uh, experience and casualties cordoba cordoba is probably amongst the most interesting just in like position um they're one of the only islamic factions on the map if the only one i can't quite recall but they do have um, a higher research rate and they have a more tolerant society, less religious unrest. Um, the Danes have their standard um, high seas, sacking, and looting. The Lombards are kind of the Sassanids of the uh, the DLC here. The English, the only English faction you can play, the Kingdom of Mercia. Uh, they get extra income for destroying units. That's a really good trait. I like that. Westphalia, integrity when raiding and sacking and looting income is increased, so they're supposed to raid the borders of the Frankish Kingdom. None of these really stand out to me as something that I would want to play fa uh, faction trait-wise. These I could do without any of these. They're pretty minor 
especially uh, Charlemagne's here. He has Royal Splendor, which increases General's Radius for all characters. Um, and then there's also a reduction to Penalty from Casualty Suffered, an Integrity Penalty. Which, yeah, I don't really find that to be a main factor in my campaign, so... I could do without. Um, there's a quick blurb here you can read about Charlemagne if you really want. Uh, of course, Charles Martel, his grandfather, uh, managed to forge a, a legacy for his family, which then pa passed to Charlemagne's father, Pepin, and then upon Pepin's death, the uh, empire was fractured in two. One half went to Charlemagne, and the other half went to Carloman, his brother. So we have this red, bl uh, I say red, but it's really a purplish blob in the north here. Um, and then the southern half is held by our brother Carloman, so we'll have to at some point, work to unify the Empire, which is a lot of the information you can find here if you really want. Um, but we will be playing as the Carolingian Dynasty. Our faction leader is Charlemagne, the man himself here. For some fucking reason, he's got a big owl. I don't know, is that, like, something he's known for? I can't ever recall Charlemagne being known for having an owl, but I guess owls are a symbol of wisdom. Charlemagne is said to be a wise guy. He did a lot of, a lot of, well, he tried to teach himself how to, uh, how to read and write. Um, but he's definitely uh, known for uh, taking education seriously. So I suppose that's maybe why he has an owl, or perhaps that's just like his best friend. It's like Hedwig, and he uses that owl to uh, intimidate his foes. Like he'll be sitting at the dinner table eating with one hand. He'll feed the owl a little bit, and then the owl will scowl at perhaps some sort of emissary that's on the other side of the table. I don't know, maybe it's just like an, an icebreaker. He goes to the tavern, um, he tries to hit on the chicks, like, have you ever seen an owl this big? And they're like, ooh, no, I don't know. Yeah, well, you know what else they say when a man has a big owl? Um, he also has a big roost. Sure, we'll go with that. But anyway, um, <laughs> our campaign difficulty is going to be hard because I am very familiar with Total War. Uh, here's our empire with our capital at Aachen. Our starting year is 768 AD. The initial challenge is hard. As for our victory conditions, they're pretty bare bones. Uh, Vanilla, Rome 2, and Attila had all sorts of conditions. Build this building, conquer so many territories, uh, specific territories, etc, etc. But here it's just reach a certain imperium level. So you just have to expand to, uh, to become victorious, it seems. As for the options, we haven't really... We haven't really changed anything here. Uh, but anyway, we may as well hop into the campaign. I'm pretty sure we've all seen the in-engine cinematic, but if you haven't, I advise you to click the link up on the screen. It'll give you a good cinematic uh, tonal feel for how the, the beginning of the campaign is, if you're really interested. I'm not going to keep it in. I'm going to edit it out. And in fact, I will edit out this load screen, and I will see you all on the campaign map. Your ancestors made the Franks powerful, Charlemagne, but you inherit a kingdom divided. Your brother, Carloman, rules half of your empire, as willed by your father, yet the kingdom will be better served under a single ruler. Do what you must to ensure that you are that ruler, and righteously so. Bavaria and the Lombards may make valuable allies, should war with your brother become inevitable. But do not rely on these fair-weather friends for long. Your father was the Pope's firm ally. If he calls, the Franks will answer with help. Lombardian ire will be inevitable. Old wounds leave permanent scars, but this should mean nothing to you. Finally, the Islamic Caliphate grows powerful and greedy in the Spanish Peninsula. You checked their ambition once before, but a more permanent solution is now required. The world waits for you, Charlemagne. Unify your people behind your banner, and the Frankish Kingdom will know no earthly borders. Well, I've got to say this guy is fairly... Fucking optimistic. No earthly borders? What, are we gonna have a conquest of the fucking moon? Like, are we gonna create the kingdom of heaven? Like, what are you, what are you planning there, you smarmy fuck? That's what I want to know. Anyway, 
Age of Charlemagne, here we are. We have some war weariness information right off the bat to describe this new feature, war weariness. We have been issued a new mission, but before we get into that too heavily, I think what we want to do is just get a quick overview here. We'll start with our family tree. Now, our father Pepin has died, and he's left the empire to myself, Charlemagne, and my brother Carloman. Uh, though my mother still lives, Bertrada, and she is beautiful, so that's that's really nice. Uh, Carloman and I have obviously gained that trait. We have been called quite beautiful ourselves. My, <laughs> my wife, uh, Himmeltrude, apparently is a poisoner. The next banquet, dear, would you put one of my special sauces on the menu? Um, the secret is in the sauce. Uh, I guess she's really good at poisoning people, so she'll have a gain of personal influence, and it will also help defend us Charlemagne, which is very nice. If we look at Charlemagne himself, his skill is patron, so we get wealth from cultural buildings. In addition, he is influential, so I guess we gain four personal influence per turn. Uh, that's about it, it seems. That's about it. Interesting. Um, as for Carloman, we can't actually look at him. Because he just disappears whenever we, we try. And his wife, Gerberga, the Gerber baby, uh, we can't really do much with her either. So we know literally nothing about our brother or his wife. Other than they don't have children. We know this. Uh, as for the Frankish Empire, we have a couple nobles present. There is Egghard, who is a general of some description. He's got melee skills. Anselm. Uh, kind of looks like his helmet is beginning to consume his face. He is a warrior, gaining zeal. And Roland, finally, is a marksman. Which is okay. It's not too bad. Uh, Roland appears to be our only general. The other two are statesmen. And I wonder almost if it would be better to have, say, uh, Anselm as our general. Because... Roland, I don't know, his skill isn't that great. It's just experience for missile units we can probably do without. So I may end up switching the two. As for Egghard the first, uh, he gives a bonus to melee. I say he is the first because uh, there's an Egghard 2.0 down here who is a scholar. Um, in addition, we have Remigius, who is a merchant, and Ragenfried or Rage Fiend, as I like to call him, who is an entrepreneur. So we have one uh, lord that will give us a bonus to commerce, and another that will give us a bonus to industry. Now, usually I would pack these offices with my family members. Unfortunately, I don't have any at all, except for my brother, who is he, he doesn't want anything to do with us at this current juncture. So we'll be forced to put Roland and Anselm and... Agahard the first in. Uh, as I said, I'll probably switch Anselm for Roland to be our general. As a result, we probably want Anselm... Oh, shit. I didn't realize, but you can put anyone in any office right off the bat. Usually, in, say, Attila, you had to work from the bottom all the way up to the top of the pyramid. Started from the bottom, now we're here. But... It seems in Age of Charlemagne you can just stick them wherever. So Anselm will probably... We want him to have some uh, some bonuses to leading an army. So not Missy Dominici, perhaps not Comes as well. I think Marshall is probably what we're looking for, integrity and loyalty. Um, yeah, we'll make him Marshall. Egghart and Roland uh, are just kind of not stellar units to have for, for armies. Aside from recruiting units, they're not that great. Uh, Remigius, Agahard 2.0, and uh, Regifine, Regenfried are going to be quite useless. Uh, they don't serve any purpose at this point, as aside from perhaps governorship, although I think that's probably what we'll ultimately end up doing, is we'll put Regenfried and Remigius as governors due to their income bonus, Egahard 
might as well because of the research rate. And then these uh, two guys can end up being generals, Roland and Agahard, eventually. Uh, as for our summary, we've already seen the most, most of this anyway. As for the Carolingian dynasty, our capital is Aachen. We have three provinces, 16 regions, 5,000 gold. Our religion is 95% Christian, although it appears that paganism is rising, probably due to the Saxons on our border. Uh, here our, are our traits. Power is balanced. We probably want to take a look at that really quickly. Power is balanced. Yeah, either it's balanced or it's acceptable or respectable. I think... Hmm. They've also switched how power works. Which is interesting. Usually it gives like a tax rate bonus or loyalty reduction or increase or something. But it just seems to reduce integrity if your power is in the negative. Increase loyalty if it's in the positive. But also increase corruption, which is interesting. So the more power you have, the more loyal. So I, I guess if, if you're ever in a situation where you fear for civil war, you want to increase your power. Uh, if you need cash, perhaps you can reduce your power. I think right now balanced is probably where we want to be, but we want to be a little bit further in the middle. So we'll have to increase our control because Dominion is 51%, control is 40%. So we'll have to find someone uh, who is able to increase our control, possibly Charlemagne himself, which wouldn't be too bad because he gains a huge amount of influence per turn. We just don't want less influence than... The majority of our generals. But I think we can spare 25 influence for now. Uh, okay, what do we need to do? We'll finish off our summary. Power is balanced. Imperium is impressive. Which seems uh, as if it reduces food from empire growth. So I guess maybe the larger our empire, the more logistical issues we have. Like more ratings. We have carts like flying off cliffs. There's currently a, uh, a cart on the side of the road. Next to uh, Lyon, which um, th there's tons of grain just spewing about, and the driver, he's got his head in his hands because he's like, oh, sacre bleu, so much grain wasted. Uh, <laughs> and this, uh, as a result, is uh, increasing our upkeep cost because we're having to buy more and more food to feed our troops. It's just, it's, it's a big hassle. Uh, as always, a diplomatic penalty due to the great power modifier. Although, despite all the trade issues we're having with food, we are actually in a food surplus right now, so we, we have food to spill and spare because it seems we're producing so much. Uh, which isn't really a, a factor at all. It's just got very little to do with our campaign uh, bonuses wise. So our Imperium is like two and a half. We're impressive right now. We're going to be inspiring, intimidating, and terrifying eventually. But we've got two of six armies. No fleets, one priest, one spy, no champions, zero governors. It appears we are allied with the kingdom of Carloman, our brother, and Obodrite. I don't know who Obodrite is. It sounds like a far-flung cousin of Vegemite or something. Or like some kind of drywall product. You know, you put the drywall on and then they're like, oh yes, you just have to mud over the cracks with Obodrite <laughs> or something. Uh, we, are, we are defensively allied with the Papal States, as I said. Uh, the Pope is back in the game and I just fucking love that. Although the the Pope was always a pain in my asshole. It's just, it reinforces the medieval aspect of the game. And uh, Medieval 2 is probably one of my favorite uh, Total Wars. So I'm very happy to see us kind of moving back in that direction. Very, uh, very stoked about uh, Warhammer as well. Because that's almost like a Medieval 3 with orcs and shit. So we'll see how that turns out. But I'm pretty confident right now. Uh... But I digress. <laughs> we are currently at war with Angria. We are at war with the Duchy of Aquitaine, Westphalia, as well as the Duchy of Gascony. We are not trading with anyone, so we'll have to uh, amend that pretty quickly. So we have 5,000 in the bank, 3,000 per turn, 50 food, which is pretty not important at all at this point. Uh, it is currently spring, and I suppose before we get into anything else, we'll look at our missions. We have an overarching mission in, uh, called the Name of the King. To reach Imperium level 4, which will reward us 7,500 gold. We have another mission to... Oh my fucking god, look at the title. Playing Lombard to get 
Oh, creative assembly. Why do you do this? Oh, the, the puns. The puns make a return. Well done, you fucking bastards. Playing Lombard to get is a military mission. We have to hold 28 settlements. Looks like we'll have to capture another 12, including Pavia, which is the capital of the Kingdom of the Lombards. We will receive 2,000 gold, as well as this little buff, Military Patronage 2, which will increase recruitment capacity. A second military mission called Horsing Around. <laughs> we have to research Call on Vassals, which will give us 2,000 and reduce upkeep costs. Our first religious mission is upon this rock. We have to construct three of the following church schools. Uh, we also have to... Um, sorry, no, once we do this we will receive a buff called Religious Specialization 2, which will reduce construction costs for religious buildings, which seems kind of ass backwards. I would want that before I build a bunch of religious buildings to satisfy the, the, the mission, but I digress. Uh, our second religious mission is that we need to maintain 90% Christianity across our provinces. It's going to be difficult if we capture more territory. Uh, we'll have to deal with the pagans eventually. This will increase unit morale when fighting against armies of other religions. So, yeah, pagans, uh, Muslims, etc. Our first civic mission is to build a royal court. This will increase tax rate. And then we have to research... Charter of Modern Thought, which will reduce corruption. So if we do both of these, we'll increase taxes, reduce corruption, and we'll be fucking swimming in the money, much like Scrooge McDuck. Uh, little do they know that Scrooge McDuck actually has origins in uh, tapestries found throughout uh, the remnants of the Frankish kingdom. No one really knows about that. Uh, but uh, that's, that's really the origin story of Scrooge McDuck. Uh... <laughs> As for trade and finance, we are receiving the bulk of our cash from taxes, virtually nothing from immigrants, nothing from trade, which I, I said will amend very quickly, and then 1500 from a king's purse. We're not spending any money aside from what we pay our troops. Not bad at all. We're producing cloth, salt, and wine, and I think we'll hop into diplomacy right now to begin trading. So we'll sort by attitude. And we can see that uh, we have a really good relationship with our brother. And we are not trading, oddly enough. So we will get a trade agreement as well as we'll uh, ask him to, to, spend us, uh, to send us rather some cash. 1500 Ought to do it? No, he's stingy as hell. Ever since, uh, ever since we were children, he would never... You know, I'd ask him for a sixpence or whatever to buy some, some new shoes and he'd be like, Ah, fuck you. Well, he is quite young as well. 17 compared to us. 26. I mean, for a 17-year-old, that's a pretty sweet stash. Uh, but it is, it is it is no competitor to our majestic beard. Regardless, we're going to ask for a thousand coins to trade. He doesn't want to pay anything. As I said, extremely stingy. So we'll, we'll, give, it, we'll give it to him lightly. To the tune of 750 gold. He's down for that. Would it be ducats at this point? 750 ducats? I don't think so. It's a little early for that. Um, who else would like to trade with us? Perhaps the Kingdom of Asturias. Are, huh? Trade agreement. They def desperately want to trade with us, so we will uh, also ask for 750. Okay, that's another. Uh, into our purse. Well, another trade agreement into our purse. That doesn't really make sense. But the point is we are now trading with the Kingdom of Asturias, and we're going to try to trade with the Duke of Bavaria. We will ask for 1250, perhaps? No, they're not into that. Uh, 750? They're not into that either. I think we want to get a non-aggression pact. Okay, that, that has appeased them. We want a non-aggression pact with them um, because our... Uh, this this part of our kingdom is, is kind of an outlier, like it just kind of sticks out Franconia. And we don't really have any defenses on this side of the map. Everything is over here. So we don't want to uh, have to fend off the Bavarians. Because as we saw, the, uh, the advisor warned us from getting too chummy with the Lombards and the Bavarians because they'll probably stab us in the back the first chance they get. So that's something we have to be aware of. But 
For now, we'll get a trade agreement with them, a non-aggression pact, because I, des I definitely do not want them to attack us. Um, we'll try to trade with the Kingdom of Brittany as well. Obviously, at some point, we will have to take over their territory and incorporate it into our kingdom, but for now, we will begin trading. Um, if Asturias can afford 750, so can you, Brittany. No, apparently they can't, and he says, Ha! Ah! Uh, apparently in disagreement, I guess, in the Kingdom of Brittany. That's how they, they say no. Would you want to go to dinner? Nah! I am a little surprised at how Germanic he sounds, but as I said, they use a lot of the same um, assets over again. As I said, I'm fine with that due to the price point. Um, that's pretty much all we can uh, all we can do in our diplomacy screen. That's all we can trade with. We'll take a look at technology. We have a mission to research call on vassals, which is here. So we'll we can have that in like ten turns almost. Uh, the other research we need to do is what was it again? Charter of Modern Thought, which is quite far down the chain actually. It's gonna be gonna be a while for that. But to begin with. We'll have to choose our very first technology. What, what is the point of these here, is my question. You could have just axed these two technologies, um, and no one would have known <laughs> they're redundant. We don't need to see what they unlocked, because we have no choice as whether to research them or not. It's very odd. I don't know. But we do have a choice between logistics, which will increase replenishment, and lexalica, which will increase public order. I think we'll come back to that. We don't really know what we need right now because we haven't taken an overview of our political... Well, not so much political system, but of our military system. Um, so we have two armies, one led by Charlemagne, right outside of Tours. He's got ten units, two spears, two swords, two archers, two Scola cavalry, which I suppose are like precursors to knights. And then Frankish Horsemen, which I, I suppose are even more so. Um, but we're getting into heavily armored shock cavalry in the classic medieval sense with Scola cavalry, I believe. Uh, we have another army in Roland, led by Roland in Wren. And in opposition to these two armies, we've got one from the Duke of Gascony and another from the Duke of Aquitaine, which is directly to our south. I suppose we should take a look at who we're at war with as well. So we're at war with Westphalia in the northeast, and we are at war with Angria in the northeast. We are at war with the Duke of Aquitaine, as well as the Duke of Gascony in the south. So we're kind of split at the moment, and as I said, our only armies are in the west. We don't really have any defenses in this little outcropping that is um, Franconia. That's why I wanted to get that non-aggression with Bavaria, because it could very have easily uh, marched on us. We are going to have to deal with Angria as well as Westphalia because we don't have any armies over here, so we'll have to raise one at some point. Um, we have increased our income by a thousand uh, through getting those trade agreements, 800 or so, so we can more easily afford some more units for our armies. And I think to begin with, we'll deal with uh, our spy and our agent. Our priest is the other. We have a spy and a priest, I should say. Our priest is in Franconia, which might not be necessary. Well, there's actually a reduction in Christianity due to what? We don't know. So we might want to keep our priest here and we'll deploy him right outside Würzburg. There we go. So that has slowed our public order reduction and hasn't really done much to our loss of religion. I don't really know. We've got Regan Freed, our spy, just outside what was that? Bourges. And he's going to march towards Poitiers because we want to take a look at these two armies. They've uh, they've each got half a stack for themselves, so we might have a bit of an issue dealing with them with just Charlemagne. We'll have to recruit some units. So these guys have a lot of spears and a lot of archers, a little bit of cav. Nothing we can't handle. So as I said, we'll move Charlemagne forward to Poitiers and recruit some units because I think we have to defend this city unless they, lest they attack. Luckily, I think for us, 
our brother is also at war with the Aquitaine and Gascony, so he might come to our aid. I'm not sure. But we, first of all, want to recruit some units in Poitiers. So we have some spears, some swords, archers, skirmishers, cavalry, melee cav, that is, and also some skirmisher cav. Uh, the first thing I would recruit, some levy skirmishers probably, and some uh, cavalry skirmishers, skirmisher cavalry. That will allow us to whittle away the enemy. They've got mostly infantry. Three units of missiles. Just very little amount of infantry, which we can deal with with our cav and our skirmishers. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good mix. We'll move Roland forward as well. I think, as I said, we'll replace him with another general right away. It will be Anselm, for he is a warrior. There we are. Um, and then we will recruit some units for Anselm. It appears, though, that we can't recruit all that much in Ren, aside from spears and bows and cavalry. So we'll get some cavalry. We'll get some spears. And he can march to reinforce Charlemagne within a turn or two. Um, I think we'll be ready to uh, deal with these two guys pretty quickly. But... Uh, I don't think we'll have time to go over all of our provinces. Unfortunately, we've uh, we've started a campaign with so much territory and stuff going on that it's it's going to take a while just to get organized. Um, so we'll probably do that very quickly next episode. But for now, what we ought to do is pick a technology. So we can research logistics. As I said, we'll increase replenishment or Lexalica, which will increase public order. We'll probably do that because I've noticed that all of our provinces have issues with public order aside from West Aquitaine because Charlemagne has walked in um, with his big army. So uh, I'm very excited to show you the buildings because um, if I was to upgrade a city such as Wren, if I were to develop this land, you can see how many buildings there are to build. So you can definitely... Uh, go buck wild with this. What it seems to me, what, what what they've done is they've axed the first building of every tree, like in Attila. Uh, every yellow building would start with one like tavern or whatever, or market it would be, and then you would specialize into like a tavern or like a chieftain's hold or whatever. Uh, which was kind of redundant because you'd have to go to your building browser and look at every single building and then go back to your building panel to upgrade it um, like if I was, if I wanted to specialize into say a wine market, I would then have to check the yellow building browser and then go down the tree, find the building I want and go from there. But here I can just, from the, uh, the actual construction selection, I can see where each building strengths lie. So I can say from here, what the difference between a wine market is, what a food market is what a mint is for example so i can actually just compare the buildings within the construction selection rather than going into the building browser if that makes sense so i think they've just streamlined that a little bit it's very good uh now we've built something in ren and we ought to decide what to build so it appears that ren has what is this cloth yeah a cloth weaver which increases wealth from commerce so we'll probably want to uh, stack bonuses on. A mint would increase wealth from all buildings. Oh, also from all buildings in adjacent provinces. All regions in adjacent provinces. Wow, I, that's cool. kind of cool. Another addition is they've uh, allowed certain provinces to affect other provinces, which is crazy. Yeah, it reduces corruption in, in adjacent provinces. That's nice. Uh, we only have two options for, well, three options for yellow buildings in Ren, and they are the food market and the wine market. I think Ren, uh, well, West Neustria, I should say, is the province, has extremely good fertility, so our farms will do more than enough to feed our people, so we don't need a food market, although it would increase growth. Instead, I think we will build a wine market, uh, which does not seem to produce wine. Instead, you still need a region to do so, like, for example, Bourges, uh, actually has the vineyard, whereas this is just the market, I guess. But that will increase growth 
and wealth. It just seems the only difference between the, the wine market and the food market is um, one gives food and the other doesn't, basically. Yeah, not bad. Uh, anyway, as I said, we'll take a look at our provinces next episode. When we come back, we will do a quick overview of our provinces, put some buildings down, blow some cash, hire some hookers, maybe, I don't know, play the slots a little bit. Basically, it's going to be uh, it's gonna be like a Las Vegas trip. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, we will go over our buildings, and then we will probably run off these men in the south. We'll have to build an army in the north to deal with the uh, the Saxon Westphalians, the swine array outside of Utrecht. Utrecht. I don't know how to pronounce that properly. Uh, so we'll probably raise an army in Aachen to, uh, to deal with whatever is in the north. We have the cash right now. But anyway, everyone, I hope you're as excited for this as I am. I think this uh, campaign is going to be loads of fun. Um, if you'd like to see more of this, or if you like this episode, please leave a like, please leave a comment. That stuff always helps me. If you don't know, the more likes, the more comments, the more dislikes, the more engagement, the better my videos do in searches and stuff. So I really appreciate it if you leave a like, if you actually enjoy the content or whatever. In addition, you can check out my social media, Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff. The more followers I have, obviously, the, the easier it is to communicate with you guys. So if you, uh, you want to keep in touch, uh, check out those follow me or whatever and uh, I suppose I will see you guys with episode 2 of our Charlemagne campaign <laughs>